as I was thinking about this whole three-week thing, I had this great idea. We should have a past and a present and a future Sunday. And the past will invite uh, previous pastors to come and share. And uh, the present will invite President uh, Stumbo to come and share in the future. I'll just deal with that, blah, whatever. We'll get to it when we get to it. And uh, then I realized I'm going to have to say something about the future. And I realized uh, it should be something profound, right? It shouldn't be something light. I mean, this is 125 years. And, and so uh, there should be uh, inspiration and there should be clarity and, and hearing from the voice of the Lord. And this is where we're going and this is what we're doing. And I'm kind of wired that way anyway. I love the future. I don't do very well looking in the rearview mirror. Uh, I forget like what happened yesterday, let alone a week or a month ago. I'm just, I, I don't know if it's healthy, but I just keep want, wanting to, to move forward and, and into the future, and specifically the future that God would have for us. And so I figured I should actually probably pray, Lord, what do you want to say to us? And, and what, do you, what do you want the future to look like? And, and uh, is, isn't it kind of egotistical for me to stand up here before you and say this is what God has said and this is where we're going and so I was having these conversations with the Lord and 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 I'm as much as I move into the future and as much as I like am a goal person and things that that you know want to accomplish and succeed in I'm also not like a five-year plan person I don't know if you've ever sat for an interview, but, and the, and the employer is like, hey, what, where do you want to see yourself in five years? Or where do you see yourself in five? I'm like, I don't know. Like, wherever Jesus has me. So, so at one point, I'm like hard charging into the future, and the other point, I'm very open-handed. And, and I want to, I want to have the fluidity and the ability to respond as God intervenes in the midst of some of those things. I don't think plans should be set in stone and uh, even, I don't know, lack of a better phrase, even like plastered on the side of uh, the building or on a wall somewhere. Like very open-handed and wanting God to be the one who leads and guides and directs. And so, like, if I think about what's the vision, what do I see God doing here in Columbus through First Alliance Church, I was thinking, like, what, what was it look like in 125 years? And I'm like, that's like some of our grandkids, great-grandkids, great-great-grandkids. And then that made me sad, and I didn't want to think about that. So I was like, uh, my vision for 125 years is Jesus, please come back, and then we don't have to think about 125 years. So can we can we tell everyone about Jesus? Can we continue to press in uh, to the mission heart of God through telling all nations everywhere uh, that, that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life? Can, can, we, can we give some urgency to the return of Christ? And maybe in 125 years, the legacy is that uh, we'll be standing around his heavenly throne talking about, remember what God did uh, at uh, 3750 Henderson Road. And so I was like, 125 years, I can't think that far in the future. Uh, let's just have Jesus return. What about 25 years? In 25 years, I'll be 66 years old. And that made me sad too. <laughs> and I was like, oh, come on. I can't even plan and expect five years? How do we plan and expect 25 years? Are, are there things that I'd love to see happen? Yes, uh, of course, but, but who am I? Who am I to say what God wants to do in the next 25 years? And so, uh, really, the Lord brought me back to our vision statement as a church. And again, our vision statement isn't something that we plaster on the side of a wall. It's not something that we're like hurrying us towards. It's really what we feel as a leadership team God has brought to us and that we are pressing into. And so let me just share this. Our vision statement as a church is 
that we're committed to being a movement of Christ followers that multiplies disciples, leaders, and churches that carry the life-transforming presence of God into all the world. That we're committed to being a movement of Christ followers that multiplies disciples, leaders, and churches that carry the life-transforming presence of God into all the world. And I was thinking about this, and so much of this, I go, God, God, you're doing it. You're multiplying disciples. You've given us a heart to reach out and to share the good news of Jesus with people through many of our ministries, whether it's uh, Bible studies, city groups, Alliance Kids, Awana, like uh, Alliance Youth. Disciples are, are being made and multiplied, and leaders are being developed and, and, and empowered and um, spoken um, spoken into with uh, the, the life of God and the equipping that comes uh, through studying his word and putting it into practice. And, and, and churches are being multiplied. We uh, have planted a Nepali church and an Indian church, and, and we're home to a, a Brazilian Portuguese speaking church and a Korean speaking church. We have a, a core group of people who have been meeting and praying throughout the summer and are preparing to launch a recovery church. Uh, on Friday evenings this fall. And, and so God is, God is like doing these things, and it's not because we've put it on a wall with a checklist and we've said, this is where we're going. We've just said, God, when, whenever you want to open the door, we'll follow you into it. And, and it's been a beautiful, beautiful thing. But what I want to talk about today, and I appreciate so much uh, John's message from last week about uh, being fully present to the presence of God, and I joked with him in the lobby afterwards, I said, come on, like you kind of stole my thunder and what we're going to talk about. But what I want to talk about is what we consider to be the most significant qualifier and description of the kinds of disciples, leaders, and churches that God wants to bring forth from our church family, and that's what, that they all would be disciples, leaders, and churches that carry the life-transforming presence of God into all the world. That carry the life-transforming presence of God into all the world. That, that that would be the thing that would mark us. There's a lot of things that Christians are known for, good and bad, in the world today, but that this would be the qualifier. That when you go into your family and into your job, that people would realize that there's something different about you. And that's through Jesus Christ, God has given you his presence to carry into every part that he's invited you into. And so I want to talk about Psalm 125, because that's been the passage that we've gone, uh, we've kind of used uh, as our theme scripture. And Psalm 125, let me just repeat what it says. It says, Those who trust in the Lord are as secure as Mount Zion. They'll not be defeated, but will endure forever. Just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. The wicked will not rule the land of the godly, for then the godly might be tempted to do wrong. O oh Lord, do good to those who are good, whose hearts are in tune with you. But banish those who turn to crooked ways, O oh Lord. Take them away from those who do evil. May Israel have peace. And this is one of uh, a few of the shorter psalms that are called the Psalms of Ascent. Uh, these are the songs that would be memorized and sung by Hebrew pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem, the city of Zion, up Mount Zion, this city where the temple of God uh, is, the house of God, where uh, the, the assumption is God's presence dwells in this place. And as they were walking up the mountain, wherever you came from, you would walk up the mountain to Jerusalem and sing these songs and remember God's faithfulness through the past and remember his purpose for them in the present and remember the power that he can give in order to uh, move and live into the future. And so this is one of those psalms that talks about the security that is found when people press into the presence of God, when they ascend the mountain and come to God, that they will not be defeated, 
They will be secure. They will be with God, and God will be with them. That their hearts will be tuned to him, and they will be able to keep in step with him. That the goodness and evil will be uh, differentiated, and his people will be led into righteousness and purity. And so this, this song kind of struck me, and I was praying, Lord, what do, you want, what do you want me to say? This idea of, of climbing the mountain and singing this song resonated in my heart. And as we fast forward and we look to the life of Jesus, we see Jesus has an encounter uh, with a Samaritan woman at the well, and, and she's been rejected for... Uh, for whatever reason, marital issues, uh, sexual promiscuity, we're not exactly sure why she's rejected by uh, the town, but she's rejected. She feels like she has to go out in the middle of the day when it's sweltering and hot, and uh, Jesus encounters her at the well. And she has this confusion from, from the days of the Psalms of Ascent to the time of Jesus, a confusion has emerged in her heart, and probably in other people's hearts as well, and she asks Jesus this question, which mountain am I supposed to go to worship the Lord? Is it Mount Moriah, the, the, the mountain, the holy mountain of the Samaritans, and, and how we've been instructed to worship and understand God, or is it uh, the Mount Zion, the, the mountain in which Jerusalem is on, and we're supposed to go there and worship, and if, if there's If we don't know where to go, how are we going to ever encounter God? And I thought about that confusion, and it just seems like today there's still kind of that sense of confusion in many people's hearts. Or at least the question of, so where do I go to find God? Where do I go to encounter God? Where do I go to meet with God and hear from God and, and worship God? And, and Jesus speaks to her very clearly about it not being an issue of location, an issue of which mountain or which temple. It's an issue of her heart. And he says, no, no, true worshipers will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, not in geography and in program. And then a, a little while later, after Jesus was crucified, buried. Three days later, he rose again and started, ignited this movement that spread throughout the known world and spread to the point that you and I have heard the name of Jesus and have the opportunity to follow him. Uh, as, as that movement was spreading, a letter was written. We know, now know it as the book of Hebrews, but it was written to Christian Jews who had heard that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and decided that he was the Messiah. They put their trust in him as the one who had been promised through decades, through generations, through centuries, that he was the fulfillment of God's promise. And so these Jewish people who were used to going up the mountain and used to singing the songs and used to going to the temple and used to offering sacrifices and used to praying specific prayers and giving specific amounts of money, uh, entered into this new way and tried to navigate what that meant. And for them, while we look back and we see the logical progression from uh, the Jewish scriptures and the Hebrew scriptures to Jesus being the fulfillment of that, for these Jewish Christians, it was a massive social shift. It was not an easy decision to say, no, 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 we know, we know who the empty seat and the empty plate at Passover is for. It's for Jesus, and he came, and, and many of our people cried out that he was a heretic and cried out to crucify him, uh, but we are now choosing to believe that he is the one true Messiah. And, and, And this led to great hardship for them. You know, maybe some of you, when you made the decision to follow Jesus, it 
it was a clear next step in the journey of your family. Maybe you were fortunate enough to be raised going to church and hearing the gospel and the good news of Jesus, and, and so you didn't feel the social angst of that. You didn't feel like you were an outsider because of that decision. You didn't feel like you were a weirdo because of that decision or stupid, but some of you have experienced that. And that choice to put your trust in Jesus cost you something in your relationships, in your families, in your friends, maybe even at your jobs. And, and, and this kind of cost and the loss that they experienced, even the persecution that ended up coming their way, uh, was feeling like it was too much for them to bear. That they couldn't handle it anymore, and so they started asking questions of, is it worth following Jesus? Is it worth staying the course? Is it worth continuing to trust in him, even though it's breaking our heart, and it's leading to the inability to buy and sell, and uh, we're being outcast and rejected by our own families. Is it worth it? Or can't we just go back to the old way? Can't we go back to the way that's familiar and to that, that it's accepted and that's understood? And, and so the, the letter written to this group of people, what we now know as the book of Hebrews, is uh, the author is attempting over and over again to say that Jesus is, is the better way. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the law. Jesus is better uh, than um, uh, the promised land and the Sabbath wrath. It's not geographical. Jesus is bringing a better reality. And the book, uh, the letter closes with the illustration of two mountains, oddly enough. And as we've been talking about which mountain do you go to and people ascending the mountain and remembering God's faithfulness, uh, the author really closes in trying to drive his point home by comparing two different mountains. One clearly represents the old covenant, uh, the Moses and the 613 commandments that God gave the Hebrew people, and then there's a new mountain that the author paints a picture for. So let me just read this in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 18. He says, You've not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Which is funny, because what did they then say to Moses? Hey, Moses, why don't you go up? <laughs> we don't, we're really scared. We're afraid, but you go. We think a mount, if an if a animal touches it, uh, it'll be defiled. But Moses, why don't you go? And in fact, it says, Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I'm terrified and trembling. And so the author here is making, making this case of, like, you remember that the thing you want to go back to is rooted in fear. It's rooted uh, not in relationship, but it's rooted in you obey or you die. You obey or you die. You do the right thing or you die. You follow the commandments or you die. That, this was the prevailing thought uh, of, of uh, the Hebrew people. You follow 613 commandments or you die. And, and he says that's, that's the old way, that's the mountain. And, and through Jesus, we're not invited to go back there. That's off limits now. Don't touch it. And in verse 22, the author says, No, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You've come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. 
You've come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You've come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven, who have now been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. He speaks a picture of a mountain that's not physical. You can't touch it. It's a heavenly reality that these people, if they choose to trust in Jesus, will begin to experience in their lives. And the author uses this phrase of, of we have come. We have come. And that's, that's the same word that the author uses earlier Uh, in chapter 4, verse 16, that says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace with confidence, or uh, let us approach, or uh, let us draw near, is this idea. He's saying, don't draw near to the old mountain. Don't draw near to your perception of God with fear and trembling. Draw near, come close, press into the one who invites you fully into his presence. And the picture that we see here is not just thunder and lightning, not of thunder and lightning and fear and trembling, uh, of do it or die. It's a picture of a joyful celebration. That the angels are gathered around in a joyful gathering. That they're lifting high the praises Uh, They're lifting high the character. They're lifting high God's goodness. And in his presence, they're not shaking with fear. They are joyfully sharing all that he is. And this is what happens in Christ. That in Christ, we are invited to come in and to draw near and to be close. That throne of grace. And to have confidence that we won't be rejected or cast out because Jesus has paid the price for our sins completely and fully. And we can trust in him. In this picture of this new heaven, or this new mountain, this heavenly mountain that we're invited to ascend, to join in this joyful, angelic, heavenly celebration, there's also the picture of all those who have gone before us. All those who have gone before us here at First Alliance are gathered on the mountain and they're singing praises. They're worshiping him. Those in other parts of our lives who who have uh, passed and have gone on to this mountain to worship the God who created them and loves them. A beautiful picture that we join in with them. And then finally, the author closes with this, that you have come to Jesus. You've drawn near. You continue to press into Jesus, the one who has made a way and the one who is the way. The way of forgiveness and the way of love and the way of joy and the way of patience. The one who is the way of hope and peace for our souls. And it's only when we ascend this mountain. It's only when we choose to put away the things that hold us back, our fear and trembling, our guilt and shame, and we choose to continue to press in that we experience this joyful, worshipful relationship that God has always intended for us. That we experience deep peace as we walk in this world. And in our souls and spirits, we know that we still have a hand on the mountain. He brings a new way. And it's not meant just for us alone, but to be shared with others. And so I don't have like a a tactic or numbers or goals for the future, but here's what I would love for us to be known for as a church. Because we are people that are embracing the greater mountain and we're pressing in, we're drawing near, we're climbing and ascending, 
to be with him, to know him, to see him, to worship him. That first and foremost, that we would be people who are known because we're set free. That we would be set free from our bondage to sin. We'd be set free from our addictions. We'd be set free from depression and anxiety. We'd be set free from the lies and accusations of Satan and from demonic strongholds. We'd be set free for this, from this recurring uh, playlist that says you just need to take care of yourself, this idea of self-preservation. We'd be set free for falling, from falling for cheap knockoffs of our future heavenly home that are being sold to us here on this earth. That because we know our place is on the mountain with God through Jesus, because we spend time there in true worship, worship in spirit and in truth, not based in geography or program or personality, but based in God's presence, that we would be known as a place to find freedom and hope. And that means that we have to go first, that we have to be willing to be honest and deal with our own stuff that's hindering and holding us back. And the beauty of many of your stories is that you're pressing into that and you're walking into that and you're finding freedom because you're choosing to walk in truth and in the light of Jesus Christ. And that's my prayer, that, that there would be more, more that would be set free that we would be known in our community uh, as a place to find healing and deliverance, a place to find hope and freedom because we've been set free. Secondly, that we would be known and that we would actually be uh, spirit-filled. And that's kind of the way it has to go, that first we have to be set free from the things that hold us back in order to really receive everything that God wants to pour into our lives through his spirit. That we would be spirit-filled people. And for some of you, I say that phrase, spirit-filled, and there's like a certain type of Christian that comes to mind uh, when you think about that person. Uh, but let me just hear some of the words that the Lord put uh, in my heart because of this, spirit-filled that through Jesus we recognize that we are loved and accepted and viewed as holy ground where God's Spirit can reside. That through surrender we give the Holy Spirit access to every area of our lives to be reclaimed for God, cleansed and purified, and replaced with the truth of what God says about us. That through a hunger and prayer we would wait upon the Lord to renew our strength and experience his presence and power that is far beyond our, no, our own natural ability to accomplish anything. That through love and compassion, we would be heartbroken that there are those around us in our families, our friends, our jobs, our neighbors, our schools, our city, that don't know this freedom and don't know the love of God that's poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And that through courage, and a radical posture of invitation and hospitality, we would continue to tell others what God has done for us in Christ and invite them to experience it for themselves. That through being people who are set free and are less concerned about what others think, how they're going to view our dysfunction, but that we walk with openness and open-handedness, that he would then fill us with his Holy Spirit, uh, and it would change everything. And the primary outcome of that really would be boldness to share what Christ has done for us. A boldness and conviction. And while I, I can't predict the next 125 years, and I don't think I can predict the next 25 years. I don't even think I can predict the next five years. I do know this, that God is not done with us, that through Christ, he is leading us into experiencing his heavenly presence, having one hand on the mountain 
as we live in this world. And that through dwelling in his presence, he wants to set us free and fill us with his spirit to share what he has shared with us, with others. A sense that uh, we are entering into a season of re-sowing the seed, the, the imperishable seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God, through his spirit, is going to put in our hearts a greater desire uh, to share our faith with those that he's put us around. And that we need to encourage one another to scatter, to scatter the seed of life, the seed of the gospel, the seed of the good news of Jesus in the relationships that he's put us in. That he wants to lead us into a season where people are coming to faith in Christ, a greater season where people are coming to faith in Christ and responding because of what they see in you and what they see in me. Lord, would you bring this about? Would you allow us to be people that are residing on the mountain? That we wouldn't, we would put aside the fear and trembling of the old way and that we would press in to your presence. We would press into the fullness of all you have for us. We would press in and continue to be a church uh, that's Jesus, uh, about Jesus and Jesus only, and we trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.